My phone rang. It was the police. They said, where are you? Doug Preston got picked up in the middle of the night, and he got dragged down to police headquarters. They brought me in for an interrogation. It started off very friendly. Within an hour, it had turned aggressive, accused me of being an accessory to murder. My name is Paul Cialino, and I'm a private investigator. Doug Preston is a worldly, incredibly successful author. He believed with all his heart he was never going to see his family again, and he was going to go to an Italian prison. Now, Italy doesn't have a Fifth Amendment, and I said, I can't confess to crimes I haven't committed. Does this story sound familiar to you? It should, because this is what happened to Amanda Knox. They hauled me in for an interrogation in front of the same chief prosecutor in the Amanda Knox case. When I see Amanda Knox in prison, I think, that could be me. Meredith Kirscher was found stabbed to death in her room at an Italian university. Amanda Marie Knox and her Italian boyfriend, Raphael Solecito, have been arrested and are due to appear before... From the outset, the police and prosecution have always insisted this was a sex game that had gone horribly wrong. She tried to help the police. And went back voluntarily to talk to them. They hammer away at her for 14 hours in an interrogation room. It's police interrogation 101. Threatened. They threatened that I was going to go in prison for 30 years because I was hiding something. Accused. And they said that I was lying. Grown men screaming at her in an interrogation. I was terrified because I didn't know. I... I didn't know what to do anymore. I think the case against her is quite strong. They're sort of building up a profile of both Amanda and Raffaele. It's horrible. That's not my daughter. The prosecutor himself is a conspiracy theorist. He believes that Amanda is a murderer. He believes that this was a satanic ritualistic murder, a sexual and sacrificial rite. Meredith was my friend and I would never have hurt her. They still don't have physical evidence that puts her at that crime scene. There is no case against this girl. I'm not the person that the prosecutor says I am. This is a lynching. This is a lynching that's happening in modern day Europe right now and it's happening to an American girl who has no business being charged with anything. The next man in Max could be your daughter. American Girl, Italian Nightmare, tonight's 48 Hours Mystery. History continues. Amanda Knox. The 21-year-old foreign exchange student from Seattle, Washington, is today the most recognizable Amanda Knox. Amanda Knox. Amanda Knox. And hated woman in Italy. You can't believe the hysteria, the anger against Amanda Knox. All my Italian friends think she's guilty. Amanda has been on trial in Perugia, Italy, for three months, charged along with her Italian boyfriend. Raffaele Solecito with the murder of Amanda's British roommate, Meredith Kircher. The case, with tabloid claims of drugs, kinky sex, and even satanic rituals, is a murder mystery sensation in Europe. This is a case based on lies, superstition, and crazy conspiracy theories, and that's it. It's a tragedy. La presenza dei giornalisti debba essere... Eh, but Italian prosecutor Giuliano Menini says Amanda Knox is a killer who slashed her roommate's throat. She's absolutely innocent. There's no doubt in my mind, never has been, that she's had nothing to do with this. 
Amanda's parents, Etta Mellis and Kurt Knox, can't believe their little girl could be accused of this horrible crime. Amanda was everything a parent would dream of, wasn't she? She still is. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. She still is. Divorced, Etta and Kurt have joined forces. She knows that we'll be there every Tuesday and Saturday. To support and defend their daughter. Today we're bringing her a CD player and some music. Amanda is doing her best to try and stay upbeat in a horrible situation for her. We're going to find out in the long run that Amanda had nothing to do with this and will be set free. Amanda's troubles began, innocently enough, on the morning of November 2nd, 2007, when police found two cell phones that belonged to Meredith and brought the phones back to the house Meredith and Amanda shared. They found Raphael and Amanda there in a, you know, worried, disturbed state. Amanda says she had been trying unsuccessfully to reach Meredith all morning and was worried. Meredith's bedroom door is locked and the door is broken down. Uh, and inside is Meredith's lifeless body. 22-year-old Meredith Kircher is found lying in a pool of blood. There were 47 separate wounds. Not 47 knife wounds, but 47 bruises, scratches, cuts, injuries on Meredith's body. There was evidence, definitely, of the fact that she was trying to quite literally fight for her life. It was a murder that shocked this medieval hill town, a center for foreign students. British journalist Nick Pisa says that Meredith Kircher could not have been a more innocent victim. She'd fallen in love with Italy, so that's basically why this girl from South London, the youngest of four children, decided to, to come and study in Perugia. On the night of the murder, November 1st, Amanda was supposed to work at a bar called La Chic. But her boss, Patrick Lumumba, told her not to come in. She says she spent the night with her boyfriend, Raffaele, at his apartment. Meredith went to a friend's for dinner. And the next thing we know is that Meredith left her friend's apartment. She walked back to her house around about 8.30, 9 o'clock-ish, and that's the last time that we know she was alive. Since Amanda and Raffaele were at the house when Meredith's body was discovered, the two immediately became important witnesses. She said they had a lot of questions for her because she was the first one that had come back to the house, and she wanted to help. She wanted to try and remember anything. Investigators asked the couple to come back to the house the following day. We saw these two youngsters embraced, caressing each other, kissing, whispering into each other's ears, and uh, the impression was of complicity. The sight of these two was unsettling says Italian investigator and 48 Hours consultant Paolo Sfrizo. One's expectation would be for them to be in shock, in tears. Instead, they seem to be sharing a, a little secret between the two of them. Then, four days after the murder, prosecutor Giuliano Menini brought Raffaele and Amanda in for questioning. I was very tired and I was also quite stressed out. They kept asking me the same questions. 48 Hours has exclusively obtained this tape of Amanda Knox describing to an Italian judge what happened to her that night. At a certain point, the police began to be more aggressive with me. Amanda repeatedly told police that she was with Raffaele in his apartment 
on the night of the murder. They called me a liar. Then they started pushing on me the idea that I must have seen something and forgotten about it. Police confronted Amanda with a text message she had sent her boss, Patrick Lumumba, the night Meredith was killed. Her message, see you later. They believe the message implied Amanda was planning to meet Patrick back at her house. They kept saying, you sent this thing to Patrick, we know that you left the house, we know. Amanda claims the aggressive questioning turned physical. I was hit in the back of the head by one of the police officers who said she was trying to make me help me remember the truth. The truth that night, after 14 hours of interrogation, was this written statement that police had Amanda sign. I met Patrick. We went to my apartment. Patrick had sex with Meredith. I confusedly remember that he killed her. Within hours, bar owner Patrick Lumumba, Raffaele Solecito, and Amanda Knox were arrested. The night before the murder, October 31st, 2007. Halloween in Perugia. Meredith Kircher dressed as a vampire and went to Merlin's, a local bar. She was just always the life of the party. Anytime she smiled, you just felt happy. Nathan Abraham worked in that bar, and that's where he met Meredith. She was your regular, regular college student girl. She was, she liked hanging out with her friends. She danced. She went out to movies. So 36 hours later, when Meredith's nearly naked body was discovered with her throat slashed, Nathan and everyone in town was shocked and more than a little frightened. The center was a ghost town. Nobody would go out. People were kind of scared because you didn't know who the murderer was. When police arrested Amanda Knox, Raffaele Solecito, and Amanda's boss, Patrick Lumumba, everyone was stunned. The police were suggesting uh, that there had been some sort of sexual activity in the house. Prosecutor Giuliano Menini had a theory. The day after Halloween, Meredith Kircher was murdered at the end of a drug-induced satanic orgy gone very, very wrong. In fact, at one point, investigators thought this bloody handprint at the crime scene was some sort of satanic symbol. Amanda and Raffaele were intrigued by sex and violence. Uh, they've sort of hung themselves out to dry a little bit by their blogs, by their websites. On her MySpace page, Amanda Knox called herself Foxy Noxy and bragged about having multiple sex partners. This picture, taken at a military museum, became ammunition against her. On Raffaele's page, he expressed a fascination with serial killers. I know that the police have been looking at these websites and taking apart everything that these two have said. To a certain degree, they haven't done themselves any favors by, by putting this stuff on the, on the web for, for all to see. But there was nothing incriminating in Patrick Lumumba's life. Do you know Patrick Lumumba? Yes, I knew Patrick Lumumba. Describe him for me. Very gentle and nice guy. To me, he's the, most, he's the most famous guy in Perugia, and everybody loves him. So when Amanda named Lumumba as the killer during her interrogation, nobody other than the police could believe it. He has a beautiful wife and a beautiful baby. And it turned out Patrick had an airtight alibi. I am in my bar. I was in the bar. When I closed the bar, I am begging home. With no physical evidence linking Patrick to the crime scene, police had no choice but to release him. 
Amanda and Raffaele stayed in jail. Police were still convinced three people had killed Meredith. They'd found a fingerprint, didn't match with Raffaele, with Amanda, or with Patrick. But it did match this man, 22-year-old Rudy Gaudet, a local thief known to carry a knife. People knew who Rudy was. We found out he tried to rob one of, one of our bartenders where he went into his house, had a little scuffle with a knife. He was one of those people you kind of, you knew him, but you stayed a little bit far away from him. On November 2nd, the day after the murder, Gaudet took a train north. Two weeks later, he was tracked down in Germany, arrested, and returned to Italy. His story was pretty incredible. Gaudet told police that on the night of the murder, Meredith Kircher invited him to her house. They had sex, but he didn't kill her. His story does seem rather fanciful that he was in the bathroom and that he came out and uh, he found Meredith had been stabbed and that uh, some guy was, uh, was running out of the room. But Gaudet told police he couldn't identify the killer. Nor did he say anything about Amanda or Raffaele being at the house that night. What's significant about what he said and didn't say? Well, I think they have five instances where he specifically was asked about Amanda and he said, yeah, I know who she is. She was not there. He repeatedly said she was not there. But after repeated interrogations, Gaudet changed his story, pointing the finger at Amanda and Raffaele, saying the two of them killed Meredith in a dispute over money. Prosecutors still charged him with murder. Their theory, all three were involved. Gaudet would go on trial first. Well, the trial sparked a great deal of interest, both in Italy, the UK, and the United States, as you can imagine. The first trial lasted several weeks. Every day, Raffaele and Amanda were there. There was just the judge. There was no jury. Near the end, a surprise. Amanda asked to address the court. I want to stress the fact that I'm innocent. Meredith was my friend, and I would never have hurt her. I'm not the person that the prosecutor says I am. Once Amanda had finished her statement to the court, Prosecutor Menini simply stood up and said, we are seeing crocodile tears. He then went on to speak for nearly five hours and painted a very graphic description of what he says happened that night. An Italian magazine published drawings based on Manini's story that a drug-fueled sex party turned into a bizarre, satanic murder. The prosecutor said Raffaele and Rudy were holding Meredith down and then uh, Amanda plunged the knife into her throat and was the hand that led to the murder. In spite of the prosecutor's theory, Amanda and her family were still hoping that the judge would believe her ruled that Gaudet had acted alone and set her and Raffaele free. I'm hoping that this particular judge will uh, be able to really see the lack of evidence and she'll be released. Rudy Gaudet was found guilty and sentenced to 30 years. But then the judge crushed the hopes of Amanda and her family. She and Raffaele would not be released and their trial would come next. How worried are you about this? I'm terrified. I'm terrified. We've had to put our trust into this system, and so far it doesn't seem to be working. I mean, we have to keep, continue to hope that something's going to change, and, it, and it's going to work, and she's going to be released, but it's scary. You have a girl who naively believes that the truth will set her free. In early January, what's being called Italy's trial of the century begins. Amanda and her childlike innocence believes, but her whole heart, I didn't do anything, why am I here? 
Amanda Knox is here, prosecutors have told the six jurors, because she, Raffaele Salicito, and now convicted murderer Rudy Gaudet together sexually assaulted and then murdered Meredith Kircher. The perception is that it's a satanic ritualistic murder, and that's what the public believes it to be. That's what these jurors probably believe it to be. Chicago private investigator Paul C. Lino, a 48 hours consultant, has been investigating this case for more than a year. So who murdered Meredith Kircher? Rudy Gaudet broke into her home, he raped her, he robbed her, he cut her throat, and then eventually departed the country the next day, and he left a trail of physical evidence. As soon as they got some fingerprints back, they had them. Top to bottom, that's the case. But prosecutor Giuliano Menini says he has witnesses and solid physical evidence proving that Amanda and Raffaele are guilty. Journalist Nick Pisa. And that's the crux of this case, that all three of them were at the scene, all three of them were involved in the murder of Meredith Kircher. Is this the murder weapon? Prosecutor Manini says yes, but it wasn't found at the crime scene. It was discovered days later at Raffaele's apartment. It's a 30 centimeter kitchen knife, the sort of kitchen knife that you or I or anyone would have in their kitchen. Investigators couldn't find any blood on it, but they say they did find DNA. Amanda's on the handle and possible trace amounts of Meredith's on the blade. They're saying that the, the wounds on Meredith's throats are compatible with having been made by a knife of this type. But something doesn't add up. Police determined that a bloody knife left two faint impressions on Meredith's bed. Police then drew outlines of those impressions. But when the knife from Raffaele's kitchen is compared to those outlines, it doesn't match. That's the knife they want you to believe is the murder weapon, but it's not the murder weapon. It doesn't fit the outline on the sheets. If it was the murder weapon, it would fit the outline if it was used in the murder. So if the knife doesn't fit, you must acquit. But the prosecution says there is more. They say they have solid DNA evidence putting Raffaele in Meredith's room. Evidence found on a piece of Meredith's clothing. The house is searched again by the forensic team and uh, this bra clasp is found in the bedroom. A bra clasp ripped from Meredith's bra and discovered near her body. On it, investigators say, is Raffaele's DNA. 48 Hours obtained videotapes shot by Italian police of crime scene investigators in the house. We asked forensic scientist Dr. Larry Kobolinski of John Jay College to analyze their work. It's very crucial that everything be done the right way. That's why we have procedures and protocols. Kobolinski says those procedures and protocols were not followed when it came to that bra clasp. Incredibly, it was left on the floor by the CSI team, even though they videotaped it. There's the hook on the floor. Oh, there it is right here. Somehow, this was not collected at the time. Big mistake. Should have been collected. Six weeks later, investigators return to the murder scene. And here's video of them picking up that bra hook. The bra clasp was then tested, and prosecutors say they found Raffaele's DNA on it. But Kobolinski says it was not properly handled. There are mistakes that have been made. It should have been picked up right at the first time the crime scene team was there collecting evidence. The fact that it wasn't picked up means that uh, we can now question whether it was controlled or not. And when it was finally collected... We have people handling the item it's placed on the ground that's then picked up. No instruments are used to handle the object. Uh, there could be a transfer of uh, evidence, uh, transfer of DNA, for example, onto that item by any of those uh, individuals. And so this was just not handled properly. Would you be comfortable, confident, if your life was on the line, that this evidence is reliable? I would not uh, want to have my life threatened uh, based upon an item of evidence that was collected six weeks after the event occurred where the chain of custody was broken and the reliability is in question. 
And then there is the prosecution's star witness. Io sentito un gran grido. A scream in the night, then the sound of running. That's what Nara Capazzali said she heard from her apartment across the street from the crime scene on the night of the murder. She told her story to Italian television a few days later. Prosecutors are relying on Nara's testimony to convince the jury that three people ran away from the crime scene. Ciolino wanted to see or hear for himself. Christine, I'm Paul. I, I'm from Chicago. Where you, are, are you really? Nara's upstairs neighbor let Paul into her apartment in, to find out what he could hear. We're looking directly on top of the house where the homicide happened. Okay, you ready outside? We've got a bunch of kids, we, uh, local kids we got to do some running to see if we could hear them running. We've now closed the window, which we believe was the situation that night because it was a very cold night, and let's see what they can hear. You guys ready to go? Three, two, one, go. Right now I hear something. What did you hear? I heard something, but I couldn't tell if it was footsteps. Did you hear anything? No. At the very least, our unscientific test raises questions about what Nara could have heard that night. And under cross-examination, Nara said she couldn't even be sure of the date of the scream. Nora has no credibility. She don't know what she heard or saw. Well, they don't have a credible witness in this case. This is part of the problem. This is why I am so agitated. But the prosecution says the case is solid, still insisting DNA puts Raffaele and Amanda in the room, and that several witnesses put the couple together with Rudy Gaudet. But Cialino says the three didn't even know each other. Tell me about the text messages between the three of them, the cell phone records between the three of them, the emails between the three of them. We got everybody's phone records, they all have phones. All right, let's see how many times they called each other, setting up the sex game, the orgy, the night of sex and satanic rituals. Big, big zero, nothing. Nothing exists. There is no evidence that these three knew each other. They don't travel in the same circles. They're not buddies. It just didn't happen. But this is Italy, and prosecutor Giuliano Menini has his case. I'll probably get indicted in Italy for saying this. I don't care. He is ruining the two lives of two kids who have done nothing. Are they guilty of participating in a murder? No. Planning a murder? No. Being at a murder? No. They're not guilty of anything. Nothing. I was walking down the streets of Florence one fine morning and my cell phone rang. This is the police. Where are you? We are coming to get you now. And they hauled me in for an interrogation in front of Giuliano Mignini, who is the same chief prosecutor in the Amanda Knox case. It was February 23rd, 2006. Mystery writer Doug Preston was living in Italy. He interrogated me, accused me of committing horrendous crimes, including being an accessory to murder, and demanded that I confess. How did this best-selling author find himself in the crosshairs of Amanda Knox's prosecutor? I was going to write a novel, a thriller. Preston's real-life thriller begins in the hills just above Florence. But I discovered that the olive grove outside of my house had been the scene of a horrific double killing. One of the worst in Italian history. And that's how I heard about the serial killer known as the Monster of Florence. So instead of writing a novel, he decided to write about a real case. A serial killer murdered 14 people who were making love in parked cars in the Tuscan Hills between 1974 and 1985. 
I wrote The Monster of Florence with an Italian journalist named Mario Spezzi, who had covered the case from the beginning. 82, 83, 84, 85, always in summer, always on uh, Saturday night. Their theory, a lone serial killer stalking lovers in the Tuscan Hills got away with 14 murders. But prosecutor Manini had an entirely different idea. Manini's theory is that this was not a lone psychopathic serial killer, that this was a satanic sect that needed body parts for their black masses and satanic rites. Preston and Spetsy knew that theory was just ridiculous. But Manini was convinced. Why? For years, Manini has followed the dark satanic conspiracy theories of this woman. an Italian blogger named Gabriella Carlizzi. She feels she knows what happened the night Meredith was murdered. Carlizzi Carlizzi posted her satanic ritual murder theory on her blog. Manini later presented it as fact during Rudy Gaudet's trial. He used her as a very important witness in the Monster Florence case, and now it appears that he's using her as a source for the Amanda Knox case. Now, where does this woman get her evidence? She speaks to uh, a deceased priest named Father Gabriele. She speaks to the dead. She does. Preston says Manini, a deeply religious man, is a true believer of Carlizzi's satanic conspiracies. He truly believes that Satan walks the land and that he is engaged in a titanic struggle against satanic conspiracies that are behind many of the crimes in Italy. Preston and Spetsy's work challenged the satanic theory of the case. Manini went after the authors, accusing them of falsifying evidence and even being part of the cult. Spetsy was jailed. I was uh, arrested. I was in jail during uh, 23 days here in Perugia. Spetsy was locked up in the same prison where Amanda is now held. And Preston, accused of being Spetsy's accomplice, was hauled in for questioning in front of Manini, Amanda's interrogator. And about an hour into the interrogation, the questions became very pointed, and they became very aggressive. And finally, I said to Manini, I said, wait a minute, do you think that I have committed a crime? And he said, yes. I do. And I said, where is your evidence? Where, where did you get these theories? He said, Mr. Preston, these are not theories, these are facts. Preston experienced the same harsh interrogation techniques that were used on Amanda and led to her false confession, putting her in jail in the first place. I'm a professional journalist. I have a very good memory. I know what happened in that interrogation. They almost broke me down. I was at the point where I was terrified. My knees were shaking, I could barely walk. And that was three hours. And she's a 20-year-old girl. He interrogated her for 14 hours using incredibly sophisticated interrogation techniques that break the mafia. So they got her after 14 hours to say a few weird and seemingly incriminatory things, well, it means absolutely nothing. You can, you can get anyone to say anything in an interrogation. I was sitting there thinking, they've accused me of being an accessory to murder. They're going to lead me out of here in handcuffs. I will never see my wife and children again. That's what I was thinking. 
Menini released Preston without charge. The writer and his family left Italy the next day. A judge later released Spezzi, saying there was no evidence to hold him. Menini declined to be interviewed about the Monster of Florence case or Amanda's case. Preston, who now lives in Maine, says Menini will never give up on Amanda. This prosecutor thinks he knows what happened at that crime scene. And so the facts don't matter to him. He is asserting that Amanda Knox is guilty. He knows it in his heart. And he doesn't need any evidence. He is absolutely determined to see that she is convicted because his entire career rides on her conviction. no exaggeration to say that Meredith touched the lives of everyone she met with her infectious, upbeat personality, smile and sense of humour. We loved Meredith then, we love her still and she's still very much a part of our family forever. It was last October, months before Amanda's trial even began, that an Italian court found Rudy Gaudet guilty of murdering Meredith Kircher. The fact that Rudy Gaudet has been convicted, is that good or bad for Amanda, do you think? I guess I feel that it's good. They, they have a person that was responsible. There's no connection between Amanda and Raphael and Rudy. But Rudy Gaudet's trial was only act one in this continuing Italian drama. I'm here to kind of understand the Italian judicial system versus what's in the United States, so it's gonna be... Amanda and Raffaele's trial is now in its fourth month, and Amanda is starting to show signs of wear and tear. These last few hearings, I have noticed a change in that she now realizes the seriousness of the situation, and uh, I think her demeanor has changed considerably from that that we saw at the beginning of the trial to now. And that was Amanda, you had a question? how are you doing? It suddenly hit her, what's going on here? Amanda's ordeal won't end anytime soon. This trial is expected to last into the fall. We expect both Amanda and Raffaele to, to get into the, uh, into the witness box and to give their version of events of what happened that night. Everyone expects Amanda and Raffaele to again swear their innocence. But it may not matter. Public opinion is so against her that there will be an uproar if she's, if she's acquitted. Can she get a fair trial in your opinion? I don't think so. Writer Doug Preston, who says he will probably never go back to Italy, is worried that Amanda will be there for a very long time. I mean, say goodbye to Amanda. She will return from her semester abroad a 50-year-old Italian woman after her 30 years in prison. Innocent people are convicted sometimes. Cannot accept that. Cannot accept it. I mean, Having that as even a possibility, I, you just can't think about that. You have to rely on the system, understanding the facts, and seeing that she had nothing to do with this. But the Italian system is allowing something unheard of in the United States. Manini is prosecuting Amanda, even though he's been accused of breaking the law himself. He is under indictment for a series of serious crimes, including abuse of office, obstruction of justice, illegally wiretapping journalists. Prosecutor Menini, who is prosecuting this case, mm -hmm. is currently under indictment. And the charge is abuse of office. Mm -hmm. 
I have no idea how uh, a person who's been charged with crimes related to his work continues to work. But that's the system over there. And when I ask, they say, well, he's not, he's not guilty of anything yet. No, no, but it's really like that. It does seem rather odd that we have a prosecutor who is accused of abuse of power, and at the same time he's the lead prosecutor uh, in, the, in the Meredith Kircher case in the UK and in the US. We wouldn't get to that situation. He would be asked to step down. No one expects a verdict in the case against Manini for a long time. But if he is convicted... He could face jail of uh, two years. The Meredith Kircher murder trial will be over by the time a sentence is reached on Minini. A few months ago, Amanda turned 21 behind bars. My birthday is the day after hers. And I was there during that time. So, so we held each other and sang happy birthday to each other. That was her 21st birthday. Amanda's parents are praying their daughter won't have to celebrate any more birthdays in jail. You get to see her twice a week for an hour a day. You get to hold her, uh, you get to talk to her, but leaving sucks. to watch them take her away and then you have to leave her there unbearable My husband was a beautiful, honorable man. See you later, from Croatia. He hit that tree doing about 60. Both wrists were wrapped with duct tape. Both nipples had been removed. Philip Shu took his own life. Yes, sir. Did he fear for his life? Yes. My husband was murdered and the murderers need to be brought to justice. My phone rang. It was the police. They said, where are you? Doug Preston got picked up in the middle of the night, and he got dragged down to police headquarters. They brought me in for an interrogation. It started off very friendly. Within an hour, it had turned aggressive. Accused me of being an accessory to murder. My name is Paul Cialino, and I'm a private investigator. Doug Preston is a worldly, incredibly successful author. He believed with all his heart he was never going to see his family again, and he was going to go to an Italian prison. Now, Italy doesn't have a Fifth Amendment, and I said, I can't confess to crimes I haven't committed. Does this story sound familiar to you? It should, because this is what happened to Amanda Knox. They hauled me in for an interrogation in front of the same chief prosecutor in the Amanda Knox case. When I see Amanda Knox in prison, I think, that could be me. Meredith Kirscher was found stabbed to death in her room at an Italian university. Amanda Marie Knox and her Italian boyfriend, Raphael Solecito, have been arrested and are due to appear before... From the outset, the police and prosecution have always insisted this was a sex game that had gone horribly wrong. She tried to help the police. And went back voluntarily to talk to them. They hammer away at her for 14 hours in an interrogation room. It's police interrogation 101. Threatened. They threatened that I was going to go in prison for 30 years because I was hiding something. Accused. And they said that I was lying. Grown men screaming at her in an interrogation. I was terrified. 
because I didn't know. I, I didn't know what to do anymore. I think the case against her is quite strong. They're sort of building up a profile of both Amanda and Raffaele. It's horrible. That's not my daughter. The prosecutor himself is a conspiracy theorist. He believes that Amanda is a murderer. He believes that this was a satanic ritualistic murder, a sexual and sacrificial rite. Meredith was my friend, and I would never have hurt her. They still don't have physical evidence that puts her at that crime scene. There is no case against this girl. I'm not the person that the prosecutor says I am. This is a lynching. This is a lynching that's happening in modern day Europe right now, and it's happening to an American girl who has no business being charged with anything. The next man in Max could be your daughter. American Girl, Italian Nightmare, tonight's 48 Hours Mystery. History continues. Amanda Knox. The 21-year-old foreign exchange student from Seattle, Washington, is today the most recognizable Amanda Knox. Amanda Knox. Amanda Knox. And hated woman in Italy. You can't believe the hysteria, the anger against Amanda Knox. All my Italian friends think she's guilty. Amanda has been on trial in Perugia, Italy, for three months, charged along with her Italian boyfriend. Raffaele Solecito with the murder of Amanda's British roommate, Meredith Kircher. The case, with tabloid claims of drugs, kinky sex, and even satanic rituals, is a murder mystery sensation in Europe. This is a case based on lies, superstition, and crazy conspiracy theories, and that's it. It's a tragedy. La presenza dei giornalisti debba essere. Eh, but Italian prosecutor Giuliano Menini says Amanda Knox is a killer who slashed her roommate's throat. She's absolutely innocent. There's no doubt in my mind, never has been, that she's had nothing to do with this. Amanda's parents, Etta Mellis and Kurt Knox, can't believe their little girl could be accused of this horrible crime. Amanda was everything a parent would dream of, wasn't she? She still is. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. She still is. Divorced, Etta and Kurt have joined forces. She knows that we'll be there every Tuesday and Saturday. To support and defend their daughter. Today we're bringing her a CD player and some music. Amanda is doing her best to try and stay upbeat in a horrible situation for her. We're going to find out in the long run that Amanda had nothing to do with this and will be set free. Amanda's troubles began, innocently enough, on the morning of November 2nd, 2007, when police found two cell phones that belonged to Meredith and brought the phones back to the house Meredith and Amanda shared. They found Raphael and Amanda there in a you know, worried, disturbed state. Amanda says she had been trying unsuccessfully to reach Meredith all morning and was worried. Meredith's bedroom door is locked and the door is broken down. Uh, and inside is Meredith's lifeless body. 22-year-old Meredith Kircher is found lying in a pool of blood. 
there were 47 separate wounds. Not 47 knife wounds, but 47 bruises, scratches, cuts, injuries on Meredith's body. There was evidence, definitely, of the fact that she was trying to quite literally fight for her life. It was a murder that shocked this medieval hill town, a center for foreign students. British journalist Nick Pisa says that Meredith Kircher could not have been a more innocent victim. She'd fallen in love with Italy, so that's basically why this girl from South London, the youngest of four children, decided to, to come and study in Perugia. On the night of the murder, November 1st, Amanda was supposed to work at a bar called La Chic. But her boss, Patrick Lumumba, told her not to come in. She says she spent the night with her boyfriend, Raffaele, at his apartment. Meredith went to a friend's for dinner. The next thing we know is that Meredith left her friend's apartment. She walked back to her house around about 8.30, 9 o'clock-ish, and that's the last time that we know she was alive. Since Amanda and Raffaele were at the house when Meredith's body was discovered, the two immediately became important witnesses. She said they had a lot of questions for her because she was the first one that had come back to the house, and she wanted to help. She wanted to try and remember anything. Investigators asked the couple to come back to the house the following day. We saw these two youngsters embraced, caressing each other, kissing, whispering into each other's ears, and uh, the impression was of complicity. The sight of these two was unsettling says Italian investigator and 48 Hours consultant Paolo Sfrizo. One's expectation would be for them to be in shock, in tears. Instead, they seem to be sharing a, a little secret between the two of them. Then, four days after the murder, prosecutor Giuliano Menini brought Raffaele and Amanda in for questioning. I was very tired and I was also quite stressed out. They kept asking me the same questions. 48 Hours has exclusively obtained this tape of Amanda Knox describing to an Italian judge what happened to her that night. At a certain point, the police began to be more aggressive with me. Amanda repeatedly told police that she was with Raffaele in his apartment on the night of the murder. They called me a liar. Then they started pushing on me the idea that I must have seen something and forgotten about it. Police confronted Amanda with a text message she had sent her boss, Patrick Lumumba, the night Meredith was killed. Her message? See you later. They believe the message implied Amanda was planning to meet Patrick back at her house. They kept saying, you sent this thing to Patrick, we know that you left the house, we know. Amanda claims the aggressive questioning turned physical. I was hit in the back of the head by one of the police officers who said she was trying to make me help me remember the truth. The truth that night, after 14 hours of interrogation, was this written statement that police had Amanda sign. I met Patrick. We went to my apartment. Patrick had sex with Meredith. I confusedly remember that he killed her. Within hours, bar owner Patrick Lumumba, Raffaele Selecito, and Amanda Knox were arrested. <sighs> the 
the night before the murder. October 31st, 2007. Halloween in Perugia. Meredith Kircher dressed as a vampire and went to Merlin's, a local bar. She was always the life of the party. Anytime she smiled, you just felt happy. Nathan Abraham worked in that bar, and that's where he met Meredith. She was your regular, regular college student girl. She, was, she liked hanging out with her friends, she danced, she went out to movies. So 36 hours later, when Meredith's nearly naked body was discovered with her throat slashed, Nathan and everyone in town was shocked and more than a little frightened. The center was a ghost town. Nobody would go out. People were kind of scared because you didn't know who the murderer was. When police 